Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to the live Facebook, the show that discusses theological arguments from the book Haqq al Yaqeen. Previously, uh, we've been discussing different topics in regards to the certain istashad and also the certain birthdays as well of our personalities, respected holy personalities. But inshallah, we'll be returning back to the book Haqq al Yaqeen by Sayyid al Shabur and going through new discussions, inshallah, with myself, most inshallah, and also. Sheikh Muhammad Abbas. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Hayakum Allah. Good to have you back. Allah. Habibi. Thank you. It's an honor to always be on Imam Hussein TV. Masha. Sheikh, now before we broke up for uh, the season of uh, Muharram and, and Safar, um, a quick recap on what we were discussing <coughs> in regards to the book Haqq uh, al by uh, Sayyid al Shabbar. Ahsantum. So, Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim, the idea was. Uh, to embark upon a journey of faith where we are able to understand the five principal tenets of our religion much better. And uh, the primary text that we were using as a guideline for our discussions was the text entitled Haqqul Yaqeen Fi Ma'arifati Usul Deen. This is authored by the late Alama Abdullah Shabbar. Rahmatullah alayh. And uh, to recap, as you rightly said, uh, we've had a bit of a break from the beginning of Shahram Muharram until last week, Miladun Nabi. And to recap for our viewers, uh, I believe all the previous lectures from the beginning of the book are uh, available uh, either online or on social media for those viewers uh, who would like to follow the entire series in its entirety. However, to summarize where we have reached in regards to this uh, text, Hakul Yaqeen, we first begin by understanding or discussing the importance of studying Usuluddin. Yes. This science known as Ilmul Kalam or uh, Ilmul Aqaid or uh, Usuluddin what is the importance of studying these five principal tenets within the Usuluddin, Tawheed, Adala, Nabuwa, Imama, and Ma'ad? Why should a person study? And the summary or the, the, the khulasa, the, the natija, the summary, the answer, if you were to summarize this, is that a person twofold. Number one, a person cannot really find direction in life. A person cannot really live a life of purpose mm -hmm. or say a person is not able to fulfill the purpose of his existence until and unless he or she understands to a certain degree these five major principles of the deen. This is number one. Number two, our acts of worship in terms of validity are dependent upon our correct understanding of Usuluddin. Uh, like we mentioned in the previous series, a person, if he does not, if she does not understand Usuluddin from the right texts, from the right sources, it is very possible that he or she may be worshipping a creation of their imagination. And therefore, this in itself, they are either performing kufr or shirk, in that they are worshipping someone or something other than Allah Azza wa Jal. This is one. Number two, we came to the topic of proving the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How is it that the rational intellectual human being, how is it possible that they are to worship and they are to submit to the command of a so-called God and abide by the prohibitions of this so-called God when they cannot see the God, they cannot feel the God, they cannot touch the God. He is outside of the parameters of the five senses. How do you obey and believe in the existence of a deity that you cannot physically see or touch? And we embarked upon this journey of proving the existence of 
the creator by contemplating over the creation. Which is why we have a number of hadith to paraphrase them that an hour worth of contemplation, for example, is better than a hundred years of worship. Contemplation and using the mind by observing the surroundings in which we live, by observing the environment in which we function, and then using the mind to deduce conclusions which lead us to the existence of God. This thinking process in itself, known as tadabbur and tafakkur, is one of the most critical and most detrimental avenues through which a person is able to deduce the existence of God through pondering over the creation. And then we said another way to prove the existence of God is by looking at the perfection within the creation. So in the first option or in the first model, in the first example, that we have is that the person contemplates over the creation in its entirety. The second step is to pay attention to the intricate details and to pay attention to the perfection within the system and the logical conclusion that the mind is able to deduce is that perfection throughout the creation cannot happen by coincidence. This is a mathematical impossibility for multiple acts of perfection to occur at the same time. This was number two. And number three, we said our fitrah. The fitrah, yani the default setting, if you could say, within us, mm -hmm. leads us to call out and yearn for a belief system, which is why we say that even for those people who claim to be faithless and want to be identified as faithless, this is an illogical conclusion. Rather, it is a contradiction because they believe in something. Yes. What do they believe? They believe that they have no belief. Yes. The fact that you want to believe in something and your belief is that you do not believe in, believe in anything, that initial need to believe in itself is a proof that the human being cannot function without a belief system. Okay. And this sense of yearning and wanting and needing default sense is what we call a fitrah. That allows us to recognize Allah Azza wa Jal. After this we moved forward to understanding the concept of the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ahsantum. What does Tawheed actually mean? And we looked at the four meanings of Tawheed as explained by Mawla al-Muwahideen Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib salawatullahi wa salamahu alayhi where we established that there are some understandings of Tawheed that are valid and surprisingly there are some understandings of Tawheed that are invalid, that actually lead towards Kufr. The mind thinks, you may think that you are indulged in Tawheed, but according to the words of Amir al-Mu'mineen, it is Kufr or Shirk. And then we ended by discussing the logical impossibility of the existence of multiple gods. And we had carried out uh, a flow chart of a number of scenarios, if this, then that. And uh, this was the last aspect of uh, Tawheed that we had touched on. And then we went in to introduce the characteristics or the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes. And we divided or the muhakkik, the alama, Sayyid Abdullah Shabbar, like majority of the classical Imamiya scholars mm -hmm. from Sheikh Tusi to Sheikh Mufid and so on and so forth, they categorize the sifat or the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala into two. The sifat thubutiyah and you have the sifat salbiyah. The sifat thubutiyah being 
the positive attributes of Allah Azza wa Jal, while the Sifat Salbiya refer to the negative attributes of Allah Azza wa Jal. Can Allah Azza wa Jal have negative attributes as per the loose English translation? This is something we will delve into to clarify this concept uh, when we discuss the Sifat, uh, sifat Salbiya. Sheikhna, there's always a theological debate in regards to these attributes. Are they part of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's essence or were they an addition? As in, from my research and looking at different theological schools, we have those who say that uh, there was a time when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was not uh, the all-knowing and later on attained the knowledge. So at one time, he didn't have this complete sifat and later on, it evolved and developed, and he reached to that maqam, as you could say. And then there are those who say, no, there was never uh, a situation where the, um, the attribute increased or decreased. It was limit unlimited from, from the beginning. Right. And it was essentially a part of his being, not that it was an addition to his being. Right. Care to elaborate a little bit more? Santom, this is in itself a very fine discussion where a person can knowingly or unknowingly fall into kufr. Um, we also have traditions, if I'm not mistaken, by Imam Ali ibn Musa Ridha salawatullahi wa salamhu alayhi, where he prohibits his companions in talking about the essence of Allah, what is known as the that of Allah Azza wa Jal. Because the human mind is not able to comprehend the reality of the essence of the creator of the universe. Then what happens is that, and this is what you find through atheistic philosophy and uh, deviant irfan, mm -hmm. where the mind tries to delve in to a higher level of ma'rifa by trying to understand the that of Allah Azza wa Jal and in the process because the mind is limited and it is attempting to understand a deity which is unlimited and entering into a realm which is forbidden by Ahlul Bayt it enters into the realm of speculation. Speculation. Yani a lot of these theological arguments are nothing but speculation. Every conclusion deduced by the mind, not based on evidence, is counted as speculation. And therefore, we have hadith in specific forbidding and prohibiting man from delving into conversations in regards to the that of Allah Azza wa Jal for obvious reasons. However, in regards to your particular question and to the scope of our discussion, in the words of Alam al-Majlisi rahmatullah alayhi, which is echoed within the hadith of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam, he says, أَنَّهُ تَعَالَى يَعْنِي صِفَاتُهُ عَيْنُ ذَاتِهِ The attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are the core of his essence. You cannot separate between the attributes of Allah and the essence of Allah azza wa jal. His attributes are his essence. His essence are his attributes. They cannot be separated. This is one. Number two, to claim by way of example what you have put forward that Allah Azza wa Jal at one time was not alim and then became alim. This supposition would mean that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going through a constant change and is in a constant form of development. And this would necessitate the imperfection of the creator 
because there was a time where he didn't know and now he knows the fact that there was a time in there was a particular time where he didn't know then that moment in time captures imperfection of the creator and we have established in the previous cha uh, chapters that the imperfection of the creator is a logical impossibility if there is an imperfection he does not deserve to be a deity to begin with and therefore this concept of the wajibul wujud mm -hmm. having infinite kamal and jamal is a necessary conclusion that the mind deduces when it comes to identifying who is the ma'bud who is the lord who is the one to be worshipped for to answer your question the way alama majlisi says sifatuhu aynu dhatih and this is something which is established by Sayyid Abdullah Shabbar over here as well. There cannot be any infikak. See, for a human being, and the ilm, by the way, this is just something that has come to my mind. And inshallah, when we speak about the sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being an alim, the ilm of Allah is different from the ilm of the human being. You and I, the Ilm or the knowledge that we possess is not an essential part of our existence. It is an additional part to our existence. The fact being that we began as Juhala or I began as a Jahil and then made the effort to gain this Ilm. I didn't know and now I know there is a process. This Ilm is Ilm which is Iqtisabi. It is something that is additional to my essence as a human being. The affair in its entirety is different when it comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the ilm of Allah the creator cannot be compared to the ilm of the creation. Having said this, if we were to move on, the sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as we said, divided into two. The positive attributes and the negative attributes, sifat thubutiyah and the sifat salbiyah. And we spoke a little bit about the sifat thubutiyah yeah. in, in the aspect of perfection and how perfection cannot be captured. Yeah. If perfection is to be captured, then that in itself is a limitation. Mm -hmm. And that limitation is not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For moving on, the first attribute that the author discusses within the book is the sifat of Qudra. What, the, what is translated as all-powerful or uh, om, omnipotent, yes. if I'm pronouncing That's it correct. correctly, omnipotence. Omnipotent, yes. In that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has unrestricted, uncontrolled power and domain over everything in existence and not in existence. Are we talking more of an authority as power or are we talking about power as in control and, and strength? Both of them. Mashallah. And each one is a different shade of this Qudra. It is, alhamdulillah, you mentioned this. You find that within the Quran, we have about just over, give or take, roughly, you have about 50 verses within the Quran that use the word Qadir or Qadir or Muqtadir in its different variations. وَهُوَ عَلَىٰ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ For example, 50 verses within the Qur'an that speak about 50 shades of this Qudra ilahiya, power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sometimes the power is in regards to that which exists and that which does not exist from a level of creation, from a level of control, from a level of domain. And hence, this is advice for myself 
for yourself and for our dear viewers that as you embark upon a journey of learning Usuluddin or even teaching Usuluddin and in particular this can be very beneficial for those brothers and sisters who teach in the madaris in the in the madrasa on the weekend saturday or sunday or even um, researchers for us researching in the way of islam is that when you look at for example the classical text like hakul yakin and the topic on qudra then a person searches up all the verses of the quran mm -hmm. with its different uh, verbal constructions okay. to look at how the word Qudra or Qadr is used within the Quran and from here a person is able to understand the concept of Qudra through the words of Allah Azza wa Jal. You find that when we talk about Qudra, yani this omnipotence unlimited unrestricted power in contrast to the fact that Allah Azza wa Jal is not incapable. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you can have a concept but in order to understand that concept you can only understand the concept by analyzing that which is opposite to the concept because the power of Allah the domain and the authority of Allah Azza wa Jal is unrestricted and the mind in itself is restricted we are able to understand this concept by looking at that which is opposite so the fact that Allah is not incapable Allah Azza wa Jal's authority is not restricted. From looking at the opposite, we are able to ascertain this mm -hmm. concept in its entirety. Okay. Or we are able to understand this concept, astaghfirullah. We can never understand the qudra of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Get a better idea. Otherwise, we cannot understand or comprehend the qudra of Allah Azza wa Jal in its entirety. So therefore, the author says over here, Annahu ta'ala, when he begins by describing the qudra of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the proof in establishing that Allah has power and domain over everything, mm -hmm. he begins by saying, Annahu ta'ala qadirun, yani, laysa bi ajizin, he is not incapable, la yu'ajizuhu shay min al ashya. There is nothing which he is incapable of doing or of performing. And he says that the proof of this Qudra, the author says, the proof of this Qudra is divided or can be understood through three different faculties or through three different dimensions. The first one, is istihalat saniyah bidun al qudra the impossibility of the creation or the act of creation to occur without the attribute of power if the lord is incapable to begin with then how can he create because the creation is a demonstration of that power which is possessed by the deity. If the power or the deity does not have power to begin with, doesn't have the ability to create, then the creation can't come into existence. You have to have that ability. This is one. Number two, in al ajz naqsun la yulik bil kamil. Inability, which is the opposite of Qudra, mm -hmm. of being all-powerful or to be restricted in your power, this in itself is a limitation. And we established from the previous chapters, anything that is limited does not deserve to be a creator. Indeed. And the third aspect over here is that he says, Sudur al-Afa'il al-Ajiba. Minhu ta'ala ad-dalla ala kamali kudratih. 
And this is where the discussion is. Inshallah, Shaykh. Mashallah. Thank you very much. We have to go for a short break now, but inshallah, please join us after the break as we'll discuss more on the Safat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. After the break, inshallah, assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Welcome back to the live Facebook. Shaykh, we were discussing um, the Sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the, the Tawbutiyah one, and we wanted to discuss uh, Qadr and uh, Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being all powerful and omnipotent. You mentioned three points here, uh, and you know, the first one was the Creator cannot be perfect without having like you know, a perfect creation. So, do you think that you know, the, a perfect creation shows? the power and the perfection in its creator? Of course, the perfection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a demonstration of the power of the creator. What needs to be, uh, what needs to be understood over here is that in regards to Qudra, the power of Allah, the scope of this power is that Allah Azza wa Jal has number one absolute power over everything that exists and everything that does not exist. Person might ask you, how can you have power over something that doesn't exist? If it doesn't exist to begin with, how can you have power over it? If I was to come and tell you, Sayyid Murtada's son is very naughty. <laughs> you tell me, what do you mean Sayyid Murtada's son is naughty? He's not even married, he doesn't even have a son yet. So yes. how can you put the hukum that his son is naughty and his son is not even born yet? Yeah, exactly. So how can you say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, <laughs> you like that example, <laughs> huh? <laughs> How can you say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has qudra over things that don't even exist? And over here the ulama come forward and they say that the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the power to bring something from non-existence into existence shows the power that he has over the realm of non-existence. Because he has that power to bring that non-existence into existence or keep that non-existence within the realm of non-existence, he has absolute authority and power over it. And act with it or deal with it in the manner that he wishes, Azza wa Jal. So this is one. And then you have in this regards to your question, the perfection within the creation is an exhibition of this unrestricted, unlimited, infinite power of Allah Azza wa Jal. And you find that within this Qudra, when you try and contemplate over those aspects of creation that are an exhibition of this Qudra, you find that together with Qudra, there are other sifat of Allah Azza wa Jal that also come into mind. And from here, we begin to understand that the attributes of Ilm and Qudra and Idraq and Irada and Hikmah are all one in essence. With Yani is one in essence. Not only are the attributes inseparable from the essence but the attributes in themselves with their differences in names are one and intertwined and when I use the word intertwined yani 
use it very cautiously from a manner in which we are able to understand. Otherwise, the way we established in the first part of the show, the shafat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are the ayn, are the core of his that, of the essence of Allah azza wa jal. Shaykh, what do you say to those who say that, oh no, there, isn't, there are imperfections in the creation. For example, they may say the human errors and the human um, you know, makes mistakes and causes destruction. Or, you know, th this is not right in the world and that's not right in the world. Saying that th there's no imperfection. Is this correct? Does, does this premise actually have any, you know, weight? Imperfection in terms of creation or imperfection in terms of the actions by the creation. Mm -hmm. If you're talking about the actions of Insan Bani Adam, uh, this is a separate discussion. There is an answer for that, but it's a separate discussion. Imperfection within the creation, yani what? For example, you have imperfection in the manner that, for example, a tree that grows out from the ground that was supposed to yield fruit didn't yield fruit. Mm -hmm. This is an imperfect creation. And how can Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala create something imperfect? This is one. Or the non-believer, the one who doesn't believe in Tawheed will come and say that this is proof that your God, that who you say is perfect, is imperfect. Because we have proof over here that a tree or the seeds that were planted within the ground came and yielded no, or didn't yield any fruit when it was supposed to yield fruit. And hence, this is an example of imperfection. And now we say that in your eyes, what you perceive to be an imperfection in reality is perfection. Why? Because this tree that has sprouted out from the ground not yielding fruit is a product of a system known as cause and effect. Mm. So, perhaps the soil being infertile, yes. or the seed in itself being corrupt from the beginning, mm -hmm. or the chemicals added into the ground, yes. for this tree to grow up in an imperfect way, mm. yani the tree responds perfectly to this system of cause and effect in itself mm -hmm. is a demonstration of the perfection of Allah so subhanahu wa ta'ala. The conditions that have been placed upon such a seed uh, and the seed actually reacted perfectly to ah. the surrounding conditions. Ahsan to the system of cause and effect. Uh -huh. So long as the seed or the creation is subject to the system of cause and effect, the system of cause and effect which is designed by the Almighty Lord, then it is perfection in its core. Mm -hmm. See, a human being cannot logically state that because I hit my head on the wall and I bleed, I am imperfect. Mm -hmm. The perfection of your bodily creation, the perfection of the biology yes. that functions within you dictates that if you hit yourself or hit your head against a sharp object, naturally you will bleed. Mm -hmm. That fragility is an expression of your perfection. Yes. And therefore, everything has to be understood within its scales. Mm -hmm in a much more precise manner than that which is zahiri. But the point that I want to discuss over here, the third point that Alama Shabbar Rahmatullah Alayhi says, Rahmatullah Alayhi says, that the strange and the beautiful, perfect creation, perfection within creation, is an elaboration or an illustration of the qudra, the power of Allah Azza wa Jal. And you find that Imam Sadiq, Imam Ja'far ibn Muhammad as Sadiq, salawatullahi wa salamahu alayhi, master of the madhab, mm -hmm. has numerous hadith in this regard. Yes. 
and there is an entire compilation uh, in regards to understanding Tawheed from the perfection within creation from a scientific perspective that Imam Sadiq dictated to one of his companions by the name of Mufaddal ibn Umar and this writing is very famously known as Tawheed al-Mufaddal which is available also in English which is available in English Ahsantum is available online and I believe that this is one of the greatest scientific approaches that have been used to establish the not only to establish the existence of Allah Azza wa Jal but in order to understand the Qudra and the Hikmah of Allah Azza wa Jal to the extent that is possible by the human mind. Shaykh, I was actually, I, you know, I was reading the book, I had the chance to actually have a glimpse over it and I was reading a section uh, on, on the tear um, and it was discussing how the tear uh, allows fluid from the brain to escape and to be, you could say, you know, to, to be removed uh, from the brain through the tears and how, uh, and we're talking about with infants and how it's very, very important that this fluid is removed. Now, you and I both know with, with babies, they cry a lot. But a newborn <laughs> baby especially. Yeah, especially a newborn baby cries a lot. And you could see how scientifically Imam Sadiq, uh, he has um, shown that it is so important for this baby to cry, for the, the chemicals and the fluids that are within the brain have to be released from the baby's brain in order for it to develop more. Ahsantum. And this is, you know, this is it. These are answers that are given to us by divine individuals selected and appointed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the gateways of knowledge of Allah azza wa jal. Mm -hmm. You find that within this is the power, the qudra of Allah azza wa jal. How powerful is this Lord? And together with this power is the hikmah of Allah. What we were just re uh, previously shortly yeah. saying that you find that the sifat come to overlap one over the other. The power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that he is able to create this infant and then you find that for the well-being of this infant, the manner in which these additional fluids that are in the brain or around the brain how they are then going to be released either through the nasal passage yes. or through tears in the eyes mm -hmm. but secretion of this fluid is absolutely necessary for the well-being of that newborn infant who put this system into place who has the power to even if i can use these words in human terms to conceive such a concept mm -hmm. that this is the manner in which the fluid will be secreted and for this reason the baby will cry this perfection not only does it show the perfection of the creator not only does it show the wisdom of the creator not only does it illustrate the knowledge of the creator but it illustrates the power of the creator and these are words that I'm using for us in humanly terms to humanly understand. Otherwise, the concept is much grander than this. And to, to speak of Allah Azza wa Jal in this manner brings chills uh, to the spine because of the amount of caution that you have to use to not misrepresent Allah Azza wa Jal even through the words while we are discussing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And therefore, it is so important to keep emphasizing on this Sifatuhu Ainu Dhatih His attributes cannot be separated from His essence His essence are His attributes His attributes are His essence They are inseparable mm -hmm. yani, And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Wal'ayadu billah does not go through a thinking process فَإِذَا أَرَادَ شَيْئًا أَنْ يَكُولَ لَهُ كُنْ فَيَكُونَ 
he wants something to happen, it's this Amr Kun Bi and it is. And this is the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it shows the power of Allah Azza wa Jal for such a beautiful system. Tawheed al Mufaddal is, is filled with this when it comes to anatomy and biology and understanding the perfection within our own creation in order to deduce the conclusion of the existence and the power of Allah Azza wa Jal. Recommend all the viewers, Tawheed Mufaddal needs to be a necessary part of our tarbiyah. Especially Not in this modern day and age where you know, science is prevailing and a lot of people look for scientific evidence and scientific proof. Uh, you know, Alhamdulillah, Imam Sadiq, you know, um, managed to pass on that knowledge. And you could, you could tell, you could say that he, force, he could you know, foresee it. That in oh, the future, oh. they will need such proofs and such evidences of in order course. to bring people towards Islam and understand. In my opinion, first of all, a number of things. Number one, unlike other uh, religions that even claimed to be Abrahamic or claimed to be monotheistic, you find that for the longest time, the religious establishments were always against science. Yes. They felt that they were threatened by science. Whereas when you come to Islam, you see that the Amr, that the affair is totally the opposite. Indeed. Islam encourages science and Islam encourages research and development in all fields of science stretching from physics to biology. And for the one who studies these sciences and he sees the perfection within creation or the laws of creation, he ultimately comes to the conclusion of the existence of this deity or this superpower, creation, creator of the universe and everything within existence and non-existence, Allah Azza wa Jal. So Islam encourages this, number one. Number two, in particularly to Tawheed al-Mufaddal. I personally believe that there are a number of concepts within this book scientific concepts within this book that have not even they have not yet been proven from a scientific perspective so haven't been dis you're saying the west haven't discovered it yet? west hasn't even discovered it mm. or the west is not yet able to establish or assert this the imam was speaking way beyond his time and even a lot of the ilm that the imam has then for this day and age the human mind is not able to accept this. Mm -hmm. I'll give you something that is unrelated. Fada'il. Fada'il of Amir al yes. Some of the people are of the opinion that the Fada'il of Amir al is rejected because they are not able to fathom. <laughs> and these people are Shia as well. Some of these people are actually Shia as well. Shia Baba claim to be intellectuals mm. under the name of intellectualism. They discount these superhuman feats of Amir al Mu'minin under the name of intellectualism. Whereas the reality is that because of the lack of intellectualism, they are not able to fathom these fada'il. Mm -hmm. And only time will tell. Only time will tell. But uh, my point that I was going to say is that a lot of these concepts in regards to anatomy and biology that are found within the book uh, Tawheed al-Mufaddal, uh, a lot of them have not been asserted or established or verified by science. And in my humble opinion, one of the greatest services that could be done in this day and age Mu'mineen, Mu'minad, Shia brothers, sisters in universities who are within this field of biology, within the field of physics, have a read through Kitab uh, Tawheed Mufaddal. Mm -hmm. And you pick one aspect of research which has not yet been established. Pick this one point of research by Imam as Sadiq salam, and Begin a thesis on this within the university. Conduct research on this. Let there be R&D, the way they say research and development, mm -hmm. in regards to these claims that are made by Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, such that when they are established, people are able to go back and say, 
This is the deen of Ali Muhammad. This is the deen of Allah Azza wa Jal. The real deen with the real ilm and the ilm in itself is with Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. So, for example, the example that you just came forward with that the release of the tears is actually the release of certain fluids that is necessary for a newborn baby to secrete in order for normal brain development. This should be a thesis for research mm -hmm. conducted within the universities and journals to be written about this under the medicine of the contribution to edge anatomy or biology by Imam Sadiq Salawatullahi wa salamahu alayhi. The perfection of the creation in one essence shows the power of Allah Azza wa Jal. final point, final thought as we're coming towards the end of the show that you would want the viewers to take from this discussion that we've had today uh, you know that we've been talking about the creation and the perfection of the creation showing the power and the qudra of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What I would say as the author says over here, number one look into the verses of the Quran that speak about the power of Allah, Qudra. And two important verses of the Quran that need to be emphasized on, Surah An-Nur, verse number 45, and Surah Al-Fatir, verse number 44. Look at the manner in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about Qudra, his power. Mm -hmm. What is the context in which he is stating that he is the all-powerful? This will give us a good understanding of this aspect of Qudra, which is a fundamental part of the Sifat Thubutiyah, number one. And number two, to read through the book Tawheed Mufaddal. Tawheed Mufaddal will allow a person to understand the grandeur of their Lord by looking at their own creation. The person who understands his own creation will definitely take a big leap towards understanding his creator. Awesome. Thank you very much, Sheikh. Now, thank you to all our viewers for joining us on this live show. Inshallah, we'll be back on the next episode and inshallah, we'll continue with this discussion because there's a lot more for us to cover, inshallah, on the Salat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Until next time, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh.